Hi, I'm U.S. Senator Chris Coons from Delaware. I'm the chair of the State and Foreign Operations Subcommittee that helps provide funding for all U.S. foreign assistance programs, and it's my honor to join you virtually at the Sedona Forum today. I'm thankful for a chance to join with you in remembering and honoring the record of service of our late friend, Senator John McCain, who was such a champion for human rights and for U.S. leadership on the global stage. And I want to give a special thanks to my friend, Ambassador Cindy McCain. I just visited with Ambassador McCain in Rome, uh, where through her help, we met with the leaders of the three UN organizations uh, to which she's America's ambassador, the World Food Program, the FAO, and the IFAD. And in those conversations, it became clearer than ever the scale of the current devastating global hunger crisis that's been made even worse by Russia's immoral and illegal invasion of Ukraine. The war in Ukraine has transformed this incredible, productive, agricultural nation, long considered the breadbasket of Eastern Europe, into a country that's seeing breadlines for the first time in several generations. The tragic impact of Russia's aggression in Ukraine is being felt not just in Ukraine, where there's renewed hunger, not just in the immediate region, but around the world. There are countries that were already facing food insecurity, like Ethiopia, Yemen, Afghanistan, where the World Food Program has had to cut down its emergency rations in the absence of sufficient funding to sustain what they're doing. Today, my understanding is there's nearly 50 million people knocking on famine's door and hundreds of millions facing food insecurity. This week, President Biden's presented to the Congress an emergency supplemental package for Ukraine for both military and humanitarian assistance. It includes a request for several billion dollars for food assistance. The World Food Program, led by my friend and Nobel Prize winner David Beasley, estimates that we need $10 billion to help feed the world, of which the United States should provide no less than $4 billion. This will go a long way in helping us save lives and promote peace and stability across the world and to sustain American leadership in humanitarian causes. I'm glad that today on this panel, you'll hear from my closest partners in this effort, Ambassador Cindy McCain, Senator Lindsey Graham, my incredibly capable vice chair of the SFOP subcommittee, its former chair, and Nate Mook of World Central Kitchen, who's just returned from weeks spent in Ukraine showing what private initiative can do and what a remarkable model World Central Kitchen has for addressing hunger in the context of crisis and disaster. I'll be watching your discussion closely and look forward to working with you in the days and weeks ahead to sustain American investment in preventing food insecurity and instability in our world. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're so pleased to gather for this very important topic. And the header of this lunch is a cause greater than. And I think there was nothing more important that John McCain left to everyone to say, make sure your life is about a cause greater than just yourself. And today we're gonna to talk about food security, forced migration, and the critical issues around that. And we have three champions who have really supported the fight against world hunger, but also the fight on the front lines of human suffering to address the issue of hunger. As the former head of the World Food Program, I'll say that you know, there's no issue that touches humanity more completely than the issue of hunger. Uh, there's no issue that unites the left and the right, that unites every faith. And this is a cause that can bring humanity together. And to start, I just want to have a quick poll with the audience on something that um, I think will show how much this issue touches us. So while we enjoy this beautiful lunch, I just want you to pause for a moment, and any of you who have had the experience of hunger in your lifetime, the inability to get enough food, and that experience, could you please raise your hand? Okay, leave your hands up for just a second. Any who know their parents told you stories of them experience hunger and not being able to get enough food? And any of you who know your grandparents told the story? There's every hand pretty much in the room up here. And I say that to say that this human experience, the need for, human, for food security, has driven civilizations. And to me, is the core responsibility of world leaders. I was not very popular in the UN saying, if a 
world leader is building a seventh palace and their people are starving, this is something in criminal territory because there's nothing more important than to ensure people get the food and nutrition they need. So today we have an amazing group. Um, I'm going to start with one of my favorite people on earth and say the words I waited a long time to say, Ambassador Cindy McCain. <laughs> <laughs> And Ambassador McCain represents the United States in Rome at the food agencies of the UN, which include the World Food Program, FAO, EFAD, and BIO. Um, and she arrived, and who could have predicted just weeks after she arrived, the war, the invasion of Russia of Ukraine. Another McCain on the front line yeah. of needing to deal with Russia. <clears throat> Cindy, tell us about your arrival in Rome, mm -hmm. and I know you were hit with a big responsibility, but one you've taken on, and I hear with great excellence. Well, thank you, and thank all of you for being here and listening to us about this specifically difficult uh, topic. Uh, I did arrive and had a few weeks of, I guess, honeymoon while I was there, and then, of course, the war broke out. and. What, what we deal with, as Josette said, is food insecurity, uh, food issues, farming, all the agricultural issues around it. And this is all, it's almost like a perfect storm uh, in that now we are faced with what was the breadbasket of the world is no longer that and has, it is not producing food. And other areas of the world, because as a result of this, are being, uh, are being shorted on food because we don't have enough to go around. So it's complicated for this reason in that now what we have to do as Americans and as the United States of America is figure out how we as American citizens can help feed the world in a better way, feed more, more food, by growing less and, and using less water are the big, three big issues. And then more importantly, how we encourage the world to do the same thing. Um, I was just in Africa, and I was in Kenya and Madagascar, and they've cut rations to half now. And I know Nate can speak to this a little bit better than I can, but when you see hungry women with their children saying to, to coming up to me and saying, please, we need food, please feed us. and and Having, and me having no answer to this. So we're in a real pickle right now, and we can thank Putin for this, and we can tell him you know, it's time to get out because people are gonna starve to death. And as we all know, he's using food as a weapon of war. So that was what was placed at my feet when the war broke out. And um, we do have to deal with uh, a certain element. It's the United Nations in, in Rome, and so dealing with the other countries that are not like-minded, and that also uh, perhaps have nefarious uh, attitudes towards certain things has been a real challenge for me. It's also been, I've also had a little fun with it because I've messed with the Chinese and the Russians, <laughs> so it's been great. <laughs> um, thank you, Cindy. Senator Graham, um, I learned when I headed up the World Food Program that not every world leader wants to pick up the phone when someone's calling about world hunger. Um, you always picked up the phone. You've been there, and in fact, David Beasley, the new head of WFP, just tweeted about you a thanks for standing with the World Food Program. We He's sent the tweet. I'm glad they said <laughs> He's also from South Carolina. But when, when did this cause seize you? Because by the time I got to WFP, you were already a staunch supporter. Well, when a McCain is coming to visit you, that's not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> a war is coming or something bad. Something. <laughs> so I've traveled to McCain, Cindy and John, one's better than the other. Um, so John and I went to a lot of war-torn places trying to make people believe that Afghanistan mattered. That if you don't watch northern Syria, they'll bite you in the ass and ISIS will come back. That clear, hold, and build means more than just killing the terrorists. I think John had a really good vision that uh, you got to do more than just kill the terrorists. You got to do more than stand up to the bad guy. You got to give options to people that are on the fence. So the World Food Program. I met a guy at uh, Bagram Air Base when I did my reserve duty in uh, Parwan Prison. Got to meet a lot of interesting people traveling with John. 
So one common theme of all these guys is why did you plant the IED? 500 bucks I had to feed my family. What would you do to feed your family? What would you do to make sure a little baby had uh, milk? So I've seen up close and personal how the bad guys exploit people in dire situations. So I went to Africa with Cindy uh, with the Gates Foundation and one, and we're trying to change the world in a good way. We had this uh, single mom with the four daughters, and uh, they showed us the change in her life. The first thing they showed us is they moved the cow out of the house, which is a good thing. We're trying to do that in South Carolina. We're making progress, but <laughs> we're not quite there yet. Because if the cow lives in the house, he'll do some stuff or she'll do some stuff. Probably not good for you. So we got the cow out of the house. We got drought-resistant seed so she could increase her little plot of land tenfold. She had some cash. She bought a cell phone, opened up a bank account because her husband was a piece of crap. And uh, they were able to get water without having to walk two miles to the stream because of better farming practices. So that lady and her daughter, daughters are now going to be able to go to school. So long story short, I'm convinced if you're serious about winning the war against radical Islam, you have to be serious about developmental aid. And you can't save food without water. So the one thing I can say is that we're all exceptionally lucky to have Cindy in Rome at this time. Between Sandy McCain and David Beasley and my friends in Congress, we're going to go all in in trying to make sure that the good people of the world don't have to make bad choices because they can't feed themselves. And uh, we all love the military. Everybody around the McCain world adores the military. But let me tell you, <clears throat> the, the USAID worker, uh, State Department folks, people in the World Food Program, they go out unarmed. They're afraid, but they do it anyway. So I just want to let you know, when we do a Ukraine supplemental, there's going to be money for the World Food Program because we need to get food into the Donbass somehow. Mm -hmm. And if ISIS begins to take over Afghanistan, uh, we got to feed those people somehow. And how much money do you give the Taliban hoping they'll spend it on food? This is really complicated stuff, but I've learned one thing. You would do almost anything to feed your family. And my goal is to make sure you don't have to turn to terrorism to do that. And to the kitchen guy, people like you, <laughs> I admire the hell out of you because you're doing something right. When the Russians want to blow up your kitchen, you're doing something yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's a perfect opening. <laughs> uh, so Everybody's Nate eventually Mook. about war with me, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nate Mook is the CEO of World Central Kitchen. I remember when this organization was born in Haiti. I was there at the earthquake trying to get food to two million people. It's an amazing feeling when you see civil society stand up, but Jose Andres was the first chef I remember in the world standing up, saying I'm gonna figure out how to make a difference. Nate is CEO of that organization. Today, you're feeding, th delivering 350,000 meals a day in the Ukraine. You've just come back from the border with Russia. Yeah. <laughs> what do we need to know? General Milley said, we have weeks for the West to prove it's standing with Ukraine. Nate, you've got a powerful group here. What do you want them to know? about making a difference, because if people starve, they will not be able to stand up for their country. Absolutely. I think one of the key things that we've seen on the ground, we get a lot of attention at World Central Kitchen. Jose is a big voice. You've seen him out there on the news. But really, the people that are driving the work on a day-to-day -day basis are the incredible, heroic Ukrainians that are in the kitchens, that are driving to deliver food near the border, that are going into dangerous areas, that are dodging incoming shells and missiles. And these Ukrainians are oftentimes not heavily supported. They are just volunteers coming together, doing the work. And we've been trying to do a lot at World Central Kitchen to support them, uh, create the systems, the infrastructure, the logistics, that they've got the food, we've got the warehouses there, we've built an army of thousands of Ukrainians that are out every single day doing this work. And I think 
one of the most important things we have to recognize is that this is also what's keeping the country safe and able to defend itself in the areas where the Ukrainians still control. The food that's being prepared is keeping people alive. The food is also, in many cases, supporting some of the civil defense that's there every single day. And I've had the opportunity to go out into the villages and the towns. I traveled up north of Kharkiv about two hours. We were about five kilometers from the, the Russian border. Russian planes were flying overhead. Went to go visit uh, a village that traditionally is a farming village. They grow their own food. And where the cows were, they couldn't go in and milk them. It was too dangerous. The grain silo was destroyed. The chicken coops were all destroyed. This community, this village, had no way to feed itself. And our incredible teams there were going once a week delivering kits of food, bundles of food for these families so they could, they could keep going. And I think we need to think about not only how we're, which is important, we have to arm the Ukrainians, sending in the, 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 you know, the ammunition and the weaponry and the drones and all that's really important, but we can't forget that we also need to keep people fed and we have to think about the systems and the way to do that because it requires a lot of on the ground work. And Congress has done an amazing job. They've potentially, you know, looking at approving you know, tens of billions of dollars, 33 billion. But if that money doesn't actually reach what's happening on the ground, then we're gonna lose the war. And I think that's really what I want to, to share is that I've been there seeing this work and it's not, you know, it is the Ukrainians on the ground every day waking up and doing this work and we have to figure out how we can continue to support them with all of the struggles and the challenges that are happening with the missiles falling, with the shells falling, with the railways being destroyed and working with them to continue to adapt to make sure that food flows. Thank you. Cindy, I remember in 2011 with the crisis in Syria, the WFP could not raise it was $80 million to keep rations going anywhere in the world. And they put out a press release saying rations would be cut in half. The next day, thousands of people were on the move to Europe because, as you said, Senator, if their family can't eat, people will do anything to feed their family. Cindy, you are now the representative of really world hunger to the US Congress and the administration to appeal for the kind of backing. Mm -hmm. You've done an amazing job and you should all know today the US provides one out of every two meals in the world in war zones and disaster zones that are provided through the World Food Program. It's amazing generosity. Thank you to all the members of Congress and administration here. <laughs> Cindy, what is your message in Washington today and what is your message about the effectiveness or why should Americans care about people on front lines of war that they, they'll never meet? You know, that's the biggest argument right there is uh, for all of the good things that we talk about collectively as countries, certainly within Rome and around the world, but, uh, but our largest, you know, naysayers are folks right here at home that don't don't really, if Ukraine, where is that? It's too far. We just had Afghanistan. We need, let's just settle down and not do anything. That's a huge lift. And so part of my job is to do just that, encourage people to understand the issue and how it will ex exactly affect us in the long term. And as it was just, just as you just said, it could be terrorism, it could be, uh, it could be, it could be anything really that could, could occur because people can't feed their families. We're faced right now with all of the, not all of them, but most of the agricultural plots within Ukraine, they're mined. And the equipment to harvest is mined. That's a huge deal. We can't, we can't do anything. The silos are full, but we can't move the grain. Or they've been destroyed, like Nate said. Um, it, it's really, really my job is to make sure that people understand how significant this really is and how it will affect you and, and also what you can do. And so, so we, you know, I have listened to uh, many countries within this circle that I run in now that, that talk about, well, you know, we, we, don't want to, we don't want to be a part of this because the U.S. is a part of this. 
Well, it's our job to not only to encourage them, to, to, but to remind them what could happen if they are not a part of this. And so we, you know, we consequently what's, what what now, aside from mind mind feels, et cetera, is we're coming into we can't harvest. So, in the long term, for us to be able to see any end of this, we're probably going to lose five planting seasons as a result of this, and we'll topple that with with. It's a sick thing, but uh, fake seeds being injected from the Chinese. And so they're, the seeds that are supposed to grow corn or wheat or whatever else it may be, they're fake. They don't grow anything. But people you know, take them, they plant them, et cetera. So this is a very complicated situation. It's very <laughs> complex. And it's also maddening, because I just I find myself, I don't understand why people don't get this. And it's very difficult. We really have had to argue um, uh, with, with, with the person who is the head of FAO, Inside Baseball Stuff, Food and Agricultural Organization. It is a UN agency. Um, uh, because for the first three weeks, the, the director general never mentioned Ukraine. The largest food crisis on the planet and an organization that feeds people never mentioned Ukraine or Russia. So you know, it's it, the diplomatic portion of it and the and the political portion of it are, are um, it's very complex, and so it, it's we have a long way to go, and with people like Nate and with with Lindsay and our and our members of Congress that are here, I mean it's so important because they really beat the drums and yeah. keep keep things alive, and I really appreciate that. I really do. You know, uh, Senator, uh, the post World War II era brought in also an era of cooperation on things like food security. It's very fragile in the world. Most countries do not have food reserves. Right. Most are dependent on open borders and trade. And we saw in 2009 a drought in Australia pinned with high oil prices, so people were burning food for fuel, turned into the highest ex escalation, doubling of food prices virtually overnight. If the port of Odessa closes, people don't understand. This is a breadbasket supply chain to the world. Right. Ukraine, we've turned wheat fields into battlefields. We haven't. Russia has. This is where the link with national security really happens. This isn't just a local problem. Right. Well, I couldn't say it any better. So there are 13 appropriation accounts. And if you're an appropriator, uh, you know, if you're reluctant to spend money in the wrong business. So the American taxpayer has been an incredibly generous group of people. If you can make the case, we're a good nation. We give a lot of money to help people who can't help themselves. We've got to make the argument that helping them helps you. What, what happens over there happens to you. 9-11 is fading. It hasn't for me. never did for John. So in this space, the reason I wanted to be in the Foreign Operations Subcommittee, I wanted that account. I do it with Chris Coons. He's the Democrat. I'm the Republican. Roy's on this, um, uh, this account. It funds the State Department and all our developmental programs. It's a rounding area for the military budget. We're spending about $800 billion on the military. I'd spend more if I could because the threats are real. But in this space, we spend 1%. One of all federal spending in this space. And I've been trying to make the argument for years, and my Republican colleagues are, we're doing better. My Democratic colleagues are looking at the Developmental Finance Corporation as a way of maybe getting a better outcome than just writing a check. It's not how much money you spend, it's what you get for your money, all right? So Democrats are getting more business-like. I think Republicans are understanding it's a good thing and it's a national security thing. So the big issue for us is coming up in about two weeks. Supplemental appropriations are seldom strategic. They try to get you through a problem. So we're going to have $33 billion for the Ukraine, $20 billion for weapons. Count me in. If John were here, he'd double that. This is going to be an inflow of weapons that the Russians can see, the military, that these guys are serious. They're not going to stop peppering Ukraine. And that can tie, change the morale on the ground. How do you get food in the Donbass? If, how do you get food into Afghanistan without empowering the Taliban? How do you deal with Ethiopia? So what I want to do is take this moment and give the World Food Program 
not just the money to make up for the fact that uh, transportation costs have gone up 100%, that uh, wheat and corn coming out of Ukraine, which is 40% of their food supply, won't be around for years to come. I don't want to look at this as just filling in a gap. I'd like to create a flow of money that not only makes up for the fact that the Ukraine's going to be out of production, but would give us a chance to go on offense in the food space, to come up with ways, creative ways, of help feeding the people in that part of the Ukraine where you can't go. Afghanistan, you may have forgotten about it. Afghanistan hasn't forgotten about you. This is a perfect storm. A shit show is coming. Al-Qaeda is on the rise. ISIS-K is contesting uh, parts of Afghanistan against the Taliban. People are literally starving. There is no economy. How do we get food into these people, because it's the right thing to do, without it becoming a weapon of war against us? So what I want to do with this supplemental, guys, is pick a generous, strategically important number. I don't want to just get by. I want to put in place a system that will deal with the reality. And here's the reality. The amount of places in the world where you can't get food into the people without helping some bad guy is growing. The effect of climate change on food production is real. The ability to get portable and clean water to people is becoming less, not more. So count me in for a robust military budget to my colleagues in Congress. If we don't get this part right, you'll never kill your way into security and peace. You gotta hold and build. And the building comes from this part of it. Senator, at WFP we once calculated that in a war zone, the cost to keep children and the vulnerable fed is about four hours for a year of military spending. Yeah. And I just want to show you, this is the cup. And you get w your ass shot off just yeah. like you do in the military. Yeah. <laughs> this is the cup WFP uses. Kids get a cup of porridge a day. This is not fancy meals. This is not dependency. This is survival. It's filled with hot porridge and now some micronutrients. And it costs about 25 cents a day and it literally saves their brains and bodies from stunting and will keep population stable until better solutions can happen. Nate, in order to feed every hungry school child in the world, it was calculated, how much do you think it would cost to feed every child that goes to school abjectly hungry in the world? How many think it would cost more than $100 billion a year? More than 50 billion, more than 20 billion. Okay. So it costs about two billion a year for the world to end hunger among school children. That's something the private sector should take on, I think, not the US Congress. And you're doing your part in it, but how can we rally folks to, to replicate what you're doing, to extend it? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I think what we're trying to do and what we have been doing is showing that there are new ways, there are new models, um, tapping into resources that are already in existence. The reason we were able to get up and running so quickly in Ukraine is not because we brought everything in from the outside. We activated 350 kitchens across the country. We were tapping into local supply chain. We were building on the people that were already there and the knowledge that was already there. Um, so it's, it's faster, it's more efficient, it's cheaper. And I think that's something that as, you know, not a, a government entity, we've got some flexibility in doing because we can make decisions very quickly and adapt and adjust. And then we can also adjust what we are serving as well. One of the things, as the Senator was saying, it's, it's very tricky because we don't want our food to end up in Russian hands. So we've had to adjust for places where we have incredible brave volunteers going into Russian occupied towns, they have to bring food that isn't easily consumed um, because otherwise the Russians will just take it. But if we can take food that requires cooking or vegetables require peeling and chopping, the Russians don't wanna deal with that and so they let it through to, to the towns. 
and this is sort of the, the, the constant adjustment of, of meeting the need. We've also, we were able to get um, pre-packaged meals. We, we prepared some shelf-stable uh, prepared meals, and we were able to sneak them into Mariupol a couple of weeks ago and get them to some of the families there. Now that's become impossible, unfortunately, but it's this sort of constant calculus of, of, what's, of what we can do to adjust in real time and have that flexibility to do it. To the senator's point about security, um, you know, this is the big challenge we face right now because as Russia cements its control over eastern Ukraine and the Donbas, what will end up happening is they will cut off the humanitarian aid coming in from Ukraine. And these families who are starving will then start to get aid coming in from Russia. And the tide will quickly turn, unfortunately, into who really controls and manages those areas. For some of our food deliveries, even now in Zaporizhia, which is the town south near Mariupol, where most of the evacuees from Mariupol are going, we have areas where we have to prepare everything to distribute very quickly. Because if we don't, then the Russians will come in, relabel things with the Russian flag on them, and claim that they're giving out that aid. And so it is a constant sort of battle to get food to the people that want it. And it's more than just feeding the families, which is incredibly important, but it's also for control of, of an area. And we start to lose ground that will mm -hmm. go south very quickly. So I think one of the things that learning from some of these, the way that, that we're able to move quickly and do things that are a bit different than the World Food Program, very complementary, right? We're not here to come in and replace the World Food Program. What we can do is very complementary, and we can build on it but we rely entirely on philanthropic dollars. We don't receive any government funding for this work, and we've been incredibly fortunate. We've raised about 280 million US for our work in Ukraine, but we're also spending about 1.5 million per day right now. Wow. So I, just yesterday, I spent $2 million on seeds because we're trying to get seeds out to some of the farmers, locally procured, not Chinese seeds, <laughs> um, local Ukrainian seeds, to make sure we can get them to farmers so they can start planting the sunflowers and the corn. Corn season, we're, we're getting to the, you know, needs to really be planted now. So, you know, um, so that funding is critical. Yeah. So individuals supporting, and like you said, I think there's a role for non-public entities like ours to work side by side with governments, with the World Food Program, and with people like all of you donating mm -hmm. to make it happen. No, can I, can yes, I, can yeah. I add in on that? Um, I've actually asked our group in, our, in the embassy, the, the, my, I have a very lean and mean staff, and I'm proud of that, um, but to take a look at organizations like, like World Central Kitchens and others that think outside the box, that work differently than mm -hmm. how, how it's always been done within the State Department. Uh, because what's, what's going on right now isn't working all that well. So, so it is, I've tasked our guys to not only analyze what's happening, but to come up with ideas that would be off the, I don't care how off the wall they are, I want to hear every idea that there is so we can see what we can do to be a, a better assistance to those mm -hmm. like, like Nate and others, but other organizations that are trying to get in the field too. And Cindy, let's touch on another cause of yours that really bumps into food security, yeah. which is human trafficking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember at WFP a moment when one of our workers in Africa who was delivering food into the Lord's Resistance Army area, a soldier approached him, a child soldier, and it was his son who had disappeared and was, had been kidnapped into human mm. trafficking to be a soldier. And they broke down right there mm -hmm. and took you know, this kid on the WFP helicopter. But on the front lines of vulnerability, mm -hmm. we see human trafficking and kids have to prostitute themselves or do anything to get a meal. Mm -hmm. So talk about what you're doing on this, because I think you have some innovations in Rome. Well, yeah, yeah. We first of all, within the embassy, another thing we're doing is, uh, is we're going to add a, a human trafficking desk which it does not exist right now in, in my portion of the, of the UN agencies and within my portion of the embassy. Um, it's important for, for many reasons, as you just said. With food insecurity, trafficking comes right behind it. And we saw that with Syria. We've seen it with many other countries. We're seeing it on the southern border right now. So, so we have to consider trafficking not only as part of, 
of, of, of what's going on with regards to food insecurity, but what the, what the prospect will be and how we actually deal with it. So, so we've, you know, the thing that I tell everyone is it, this, it, it's not food insecurity, it's not agriculture, it, and it's not human trafficking, it's one big pile. And we have to be able to take a look at it and look differently at it. Because the more food insecurity we have, the more insecurity we have on every level, national security, everything else, migration comes right behind it. And then here comes trafficking. It's already occurring uh, with so many of our refugees coming across the borders, not so much in Poland, but in some of the other countries that they're coming into. Um, there's some serious trafficking going on, and it's a cry and shame because it's women and children. It always is women and children that get hit first. Thank you, and thank you for your work and starting that desk there. Yeah, yeah. have a desk. <laughs> <laughs> it's a start. Uh, <laughs> Senator, one of the most frustrating questions I get asked about this is, oh, we should teach a man or a woman to fish, not give them a fish. And on the front lines of hunger in Ukraine or wherever, we're dealing with people who don't have a fishing rod, they don't have a string, they don't have any bait, and there's no water to put the hook in. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I get frustrated because we seem to have a gap of understanding that somehow we're creating dependency right. and people don't want to work. And yeah. could you? Yeah, I mean, help I, me be not frustrated. How many about people this? are waking up in Ukraine today and say, let's go fishing? <laughs> what do you want to do? Well, I thought I'd go fishing. <laughs> so America gets helping Ukraine. PETFAR, remember PETFAR? Mm -hmm. $40 billion, President Bush, President Obama, everybody kept it going. Roy, it's been great on this subcommittee. Sheldon, he will spend money on worthy causes. Uh, the bottom line is we turned AIDS around because we took a focus. We had the private sector. We need some like star power for the, the food security issue. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Elon Musk said, I'll, they want me to give a billion dollars to the World Food Program. Tell me how that will stop hunger. It won't, but it will help. Yeah. Okay? If you got a billion dollars to give, it's a pretty good thing to do. So what I'm trying to do is convince people that you would do almost anything to feed your family. Why do you think anybody else would be different? If you want to beat the Russians, you got to take some tactics off the table. They're going to starve everybody out in eastern Ukraine. Well, we got drones. Maybe there's some really creative ways to get food into the backyard of the enemy without empowering the enemy. But what's missing here, I think, is that we need, we've had PETFAR, we've had AIDS, we've had all these rock stars, movie stars, and it did move the needle a bit. So what I'd like to see is some people in the private sector. You know, I mean, you, you've done great. People with money shine a light on this. Because here's the good news. For a fraction of the cost of a war, you can prevent a war. I mean, this is a rounding error. I mean, an F-22 is like 20-something billion dollars. You know, I'm a pretty hawkish guy, but I have learned that if you want to hold and build in these areas, you can't kill them and walk away. Killing the terrorists and walking away gets you the same outcome. It's even worse because people don't trust you anymore. Just think of the damage we've done to our country by just walking away from Afghanistan. We were there 20 years, so it's just not walking away. But we trained the Afghan army to fight with medevacs being supplied by us, Jack, air power and some level of intel they couldn't generate, and they fought. Then we pulled the rug, we changed the formula after 20 years, and the rest is history. So we've got a chance here to reset the world. Putin has done more for NATO than any single person alive. Mm. He's done more for democracy than any of us. So John McCain was known for going to really crappy places, <laughs> saying things that nobody else would say that needed to be said. But I could never get John to go to Africa with me. Yeah. He says, it's just too hard. I don't know how we solve that problem. John had a vision to contest the bad guy in the battle space. But in this area, it is overwhelming. And here's the good news, folks. The amount of money you need here is a fraction to get good outcomes. Because people will learn to fish. They want to learn to fish. But you got to do two things at once. You got to set in place the infrastructure over time to build once you clear and hold. And you got to realize that the outcome 
and Ukraine affects Africa. Because if the Ukraine goes out of food production, the World Food Program is going to get hit with high inflation bills on the transportation front. If we don't backfill, then you're going to have a nightmare in Africa. The Saudis and the Gulf Arab states need to do more here. So my promise to all of you is not only to try to be generous with taxpayer dollars, but try to get the private sector more involved in the rest of the world with some money to invest, because we're all in this one together. So one of the great power in having the McCain couple, Cindy and John, support this cause is when anyone with military credibility says this is important to stability. Yes. For an organization like WFP, it moves the world. And so to any of you um, with the military background or that position, understand your words saying we need to stabilize the situation. We don't want mass migration. People want to stay. We want to give them a chance to stay. But that food is so essential. We're going to use our last few minutes. I'm just going to ask each person to say what they feel uh, they want to share as we close out here. So, Nate? Yeah, two things real quick. Uh, one is, I, and as has been said very often the last couple of days, um, we can't underestimate the brutality of the Russian regime and what they're willing to do. Um, you know, we've been maybe hoping that there'd be corridors and humanitarian assistance, we'd have access, and it's, it's not going to happen. We can't hope, we can't imagine that that's going to happen. We can't negotiate our way out of this. Um, you know, I've seen the war crimes with my own eyes. You know, I've seen people burned to death and killed. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is we need to move quickly. I know General Milley said this last night. There are a lot of areas right now in Ukraine where the Russians have left. Um, we need to make sure those areas are supported. Um, our teams have been going every single day to villages and towns all in Kiev and the, north, the Northeast. Um, today, for the first time, we just started serving meals in a town called Trosnyets, which uh, was uh, a Ford operating base for the Russians. They took over the train station. It's completely obliterated. As the Russians were leaving, they turned the tanks and shot at the hospital for no reason, just to shoot the hospital. Um, and we need to get food into those places as quickly as possible to support these families because there is nothing there. There's no food storage, there's no restaurants, there's, no, there's nothing there. So time is of the essence, but also the Ukrainian spirit and the Ukrainians are willing to do the work. They want to do the work. We've seen them doing the work on the front lines, fighting back. So we just need to give them the tools that they need and the support that they need um, to get through this and do it very quickly. So. I'm going to go to the senator, so you can have the last word here, well, Cindy. Well, uh, an opportunity exists on all this suffering. Take it. We got a chance here to make NATO stronger. Hope Finland and Sweden will join. We're going to do an appropriations bill here in a couple of weeks, guys. If we don't look at this as a strategic moment to put money into the system that would lead to food security in a variety of places that will make the war less likely to spread and the outcome more for us, we're crazy. So I want to lead this optimistic. The Ukrainian people have taught us what you're willing to do for your own freedom. They have reawakened that part of America that maybe, you know, sometimes you, when you experience freedom for a long time unchallenged, you get a little lazy. These folks have woken me up to what it costs to be free. I just got back from Japan, Australia, and China. There's a backlash against China. People are really getting tired of being bullied in this world. People want to be self-sufficient. They don't want a handout. They do want to be able to feed themselves and learn to fish. But the reality is, until you provide a certain level of security, none of this works. So to my military friends, thank you for what you've been doing for 20 years. But they will be the biggest champion of this cause. Ask any military leader, what do we need? We need some civilian help to build a rule of law system, an economy that works for everybody, and give food to a mother to feed her kids without her having to prostitute herself. And that is all possible, and it's gonna start with a supplemental in a couple of weeks. I see General Clark going, yep. <laughs> so thank you. All right. And Cindy. Well, I guess I love to leave this group, especially every year, with an action item. 
And this, this is what I have to say. We can't do this alone. You cannot rely on the State Department, the UN, the US government to, to just do it all. It's, there simply isn't enough to go around. So the idea of public-private partnerships, the idea of being able to think outside the box and do it a different way and, 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 and rework things is very important. So for you and your businesses and you and your, in your other organizations that you work in, nonprofits, whatever it may be, there are ways to do this together. Um, I haven't thought of it yet, but you can. And so, and as, as Nate said, we have to do it now. We have to do it now. This is urgent because we're going to lose an entire population of a country if we don't, and other countries as well. Uh, we, one thing we didn't really touch on much was climate change. Climate change is a huge combatant in this. Uh, and so it, it, we kind of have to double down on everything. So if you take away anything from this, please know I'd like you to think what you can do. Uh, of course, money is very important. <laughs> but, but think what you can do. Maybe help with the transportation system. Try to think about other ways, communication systems, whatever it may be, to help these people and to help other, other countries as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so with Cindy's call to action, just to remember, one cup of food a day changes a child's life forever. There are people in Europe today who remember when the US, after World War II, they were starving. There are people in Japan who remember and will always be allies to the US because that cup of food came at the moment of total vulnerability. And so um, for those of you wondering, you know, John McCain was a hero, Cindy's a hero, when can I be a hero? I bet Nate didn't expect to be on the front lines of the border with Russia, feeding hundreds of thousands of people. When that true north, when that calling comes, no, you can make a difference. And we're talk, turning ordinary people into extraordinary heroes. We're seeing it happen in Ukraine. They've inspired us, but all of you can do that too. So take Cindy's call to action and, and make a difference uh, and follow your true north. Thank you. Thank you.